Greetings, everyone. Today I want to put this John Lensley Hood Class A amplifier clone on the Quant Asylum audio analyzer and see how it performs. I want to do a couple things before we get to that. Several years ago, this was sent in from a viewer as a kit. Wanted me to assemble it and try it out. He also included these transistors here. So I built the kit up and installed those transistors first, tested it out, and I noticed there was a problem. There was a lot of distortion at high frequencies. When I performed step response tests, I noticed that the rise time was slow. So this is supposed to be a square wave, but it looked like this. The fall time was okay, though, just the rise time. So I suggested a couple things but ended up putting the original transistors that came with the kit. And I believe these are fake. They're supposed to be 3055s. But for one thing, the text flakes off very easily. Pretty typical of these TO3 transistors that are counterfeit. The numbers scrape off easy. But when I did that, the step response looked pretty good. Except now I was getting a ring on the positive edge of the square wave. So what I ended up doing is putting this capacitor in parallel with the feedback resistor here and that took care of that. What I want to do is take that back out and look at it and try to put another value in there. Though I was getting full frequency response with the way it's set up now, I just wanted to uh, see if I can back off a little bit on that value. I'll, run some tests first and see how it works out. I'll test this thing running at 24 volts, 8 ohm loads. These amps are kind of load invariant because you bias them up depending on the load you're going to use. For example, if you set this up for a 4 ohm load and only use 8 ohms, this thing will be drawing a lot of current just sitting idle, dissipating tons of power. And conversely, if you have it set up for a lighter load like an 8 ohm and run it at 4, it'll clip early because it becomes current starved. So yeah, you really want to set these up for the load you're going to use. Okay, so I have the 8 ohm non-inductive load connected. And you can see if I turn the current down, you can see on the right, the red display there, the current's at 700 milliamps. And it's not doing so well and it's shrinking so you want to turn this up and it's still rising you can see it's rising a bit and it stopped right, right around there around uh, 900 milliamps but you really should go a bit higher because a actual speaker will uh, vary somewhat in impedance. Depends on the speaker you're using. I'll just run it at 1.1 milli or uh, amps. And of course when I turn the signal off or shrink it down it's that current actually goes up. See how much it goes up. These amps actually draw a little less current when they're driving full signal into the load. So, quick frequency response check here on the scope. So we're at one kilohertz. And we're at 22. Yeah, frequency response is good. It's uh, starting to roll off just a bit. About 40. 40 kilohertz right there. So yeah, I just want to check a few things out here. Here's a square wave response of the amp. And it's a little bit slow. mainly due to the capacitor, I think. I'm going to take that capacitor out so it's back to factory form. 
Okay, I removed the 500 pico farad capacitor across that feedback resistor, and you can see much sharper now, but there is a little bit of ring. Not nearly as bad as before. It could have been the current and the load. There is a significant overshoot there. And it's a little overshoot there on the negative rail. It still might benefit from some capacitance. You can see when I put the 100 nano capacitor across the load, one of my stability tests I do, it does go unstable. Yeah, so I'll try some feedback capacitance, see how that works out. That's 100 pico across that negative feedback resistor. I'm just kind of holding it there with my hand and it clears it up you can see it just gives us a bit of ring so that's pretty good stability so if I take off the uh, capacitive load across the output so now I have the 100 pico farad capacitor across the feedback resistor without the capacitive load on the output and it looks pretty good it's about as good as I'm going to get it I think so I'll go ahead and solder that into place. Seems to be compensating the amplifier nicely. Okay, yeah, our bandwidth is much better now with that capacitor. This is 100 kilohertz. It can't go much higher. It starts to get into slew rate limiting. I can see. See how it kind of gets pointy at the top? Almost like a triangle waveform. It's slew rate limited. But yeah, but um, it's not rolling off like it did before around 40 kilohertz. So it's much better now. Good stability. Yeah, I'm happy with this. I think that's what I'll use to test the amplifier on the analyzer. Okay, for what I call the kickoff test, we're at 1 watt, 8 ohms, 1 kilohertz. And... Uh, not bad at all really in fact I'm kinda of surprised you know it's a pretty simple amp there's not a lot of components in it and we're getting 0 0.01 percent so yeah I don't, I don't think that's really too bad uh, gain of the amplifier is about 22 dB frequency response of this amplifier well, we're down a little more than 1 dB, like 1.2 dB at 20 hertz. You have to remember this is a capacitively coupled output, so the value of the capacitor is the main reason for that. You could choose a larger value if you wanted this to roll off less, but you know, I don't think it's real serious. It's only a little over a dB down at 20 hertz. And at the top end of the scale, very good. It's like one-tenth of a dB down at 20 kilohertz. We already saw that it was doing pretty good on the scope. Power versus distortion. Well, you're seeing that, what I call the Class A amp ramp. You know, the more simple the design of the Class A amp, the more steep this curve is. And this is starting out around 100 milliwatts. It's very low, around 0.003%. And as you saw in the kickoff test, it was a little over 0.01% at one watt here. And then it starts to knee up into distortion. And around 6.3 watts at 0.1%. And at the 1% line, we're around 8.1 watts. So, no, it's not a powerhouse or anything. It's exactly the output I would expect being a single-ended amp into 8 ohms with a 24-volt supply. Now, if you happen to connect the amplifier to a 4-ohm load without adjusting its bias, you know, a setup for 8 ohms here, it's not going to hurt the amplifier any because the current is set. It's just not going to give you any more output current, so you're not going to get more power from a 4 ohm load. In fact, it'll probably be somewhat less. Frequency versus distortion. You can see we're getting those low numbers 
right around the one kilohertz range which you know that's the best point to go for the lowest numbers because that's where your hearing is going to be most sensitive to the harmonics but at lower frequencies you're seeing that rise and you know that's pretty typical of a capacitively coupled output of the amplifier because as the voltage on the plates of the capacitor increase you get more distortion from those electrolytic capacitors and as the frequency increases towards the high end of the scale we're going above the 0.1 percent line around eight and a half kilohertz and we end up at 20 kilohertz what would that be just under 0.0 i'm sorry 0.2 percent just under that so it's all in all not a bad showing really well 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 i'm actually quite surprised with this thing it performs better than i expected i was expecting maybe around 0.3 percent and probably even a lot more at higher frequencies and even at high powers maybe close to one percent but no it uh it gives pretty respectable numbers. I mean, it's only a four transistor amplifier. I'm glad I reevaluated its stability and you know put a better part in there. And it just improves the stability a little bit without degrading its performance. That capacitor I stuck in there before was a little overkill. It started to uh, diminish its performance. I'm sure I wouldn't have got as good as high frequency performance had I stuck with that other part. But at least now if there is some capacitance on the output, such as long speaker leads or something like that, it's not going to go into oscillation. I must admit though, I'm not a big fan of Class A, mainly because it just draws so much power. I mean, to get that output power of, you know, 8 watts, the thing's drawing close to 35. And even sitting idle, putting nothing out, it's drawing that much power, maybe even a bit more. So they need quite a bit of heat sink because of that constant power draw. And they're trying to address an issue I don't think really is a problem, and that's crossover distortion. A properly biased Class AB amp has very low distortion at low power. So there's just no way crossover distortion in a properly biased AB amp is audible. Of course, class A eliminates that problem because both the transistors are conducting throughout the 360 degree of the cycle. So there is no crossover to worry about. But like I say, it's I don't think a, a properly set up AB amp is an issue with crossover distortion anyway. So to me, it makes it a moot point to have a class A amplifier. But hey, that's my opinion. You might have a differing opinion than I do. So if you have a Class A amp and you like it, hey, that's awesome. No problem. But that's all I'm going to say here. We'll catch you in the next one, and I thank you for watching.